we're entering a are in a period that um, has its own language. Sure. And uh, and I think collective unconscious is part of this language of the new age. Yeah. And to take the concept of a collective unconscious seriously. And uh, that's all the reason for using that term collective unconscious instead of mystique because it must be taken seriously. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, Colleen Kubera and I are going to do a reprise of her teaching on the mark of the self uh, that we did Tuesday night because we had a bunch of technical problems on Tuesday night, and this is a very important teaching. So, I, uh, Colleen, go ahead. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Thank, thanks. It's, uh, I'm so sorry that we had the difficulty that we had um, because the teaching has got a flow to it. And so um, it's nice to have this opportunity to discuss it with you again. Uh, so we were talking about the uh, major tenets that I think are so important to address for any artist. Any artist needs to take a look at what is their personal style? What is it that they, how do they do what it is that they do? Whether they're sculpting or painting or writing a book, what is their style? And then what is it that they have to say? You know, what, what do you want to talk about um, when you go into the studio or you've carved out that time to write? You know, what, well, Colleen, what is isn't it more than any artist though? Isn't it any person? Is well, it? it really is. Yes, it really is. You know, that being clear about what it is that you're wanting to say and how you want to say it is a lifelong process you sure. know, of developing your way of doing it. But just having that focus to begin with. Yeah. 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 Whether you're uh, making soup for dinner, you know. It helps a lot <laughs> to have this in mind. It's uh, actually the, the idea of the stages and phases of the creative process, which was what we were really focused on, um, came about after I'd been creating for years, but I'd been uh, sort of by the seat of my pants, um, uh, seeking and enjoying one um, peak experience after another, that uh, inspiration would come to me. I couldn't get it out fast enough. I was riding the inspiration train until I hit a tough spot in my life, um, late 20s, around 30, and went dry. And uh, this happens to almost every creative person at some point in their life, big time. It can happen little time, you know, just for a few hours in the studio or a few days. But this turned out to be uh, quite a big one that, that involves therapy and um, a lot of soul searching. So it went on for about four years. And I went to a workshop uh, on creativity that the National Training Laboratories uh, was putting on at Smith College. And... Um, said, this is what I'm here for. I want to know what happened. What is happening? Uh, am I just not an artist? Maybe that's the message. Um, but I want to know what happened. And, and I don't want it to ever happen again if I can break through this. And I spent, um, I, I think I was there for probably eight or nine days. It seemed like a long time. Uh, and they gave me a studio and a wonderful group to work with. Uh, very intelligent people that cared as much about creativity as I did. And I went through the whole process of um, the intention of wanting to find this out and the darkness. And one morning when we were meeting in, with the group in terms of how are you doing, this is about two days before the end of the workshop, all of a sudden, now, when I started to describe what I had been doing, all of a sudden, 
it just was clear to me. Well, first I came here and I said, this is what I want. And then I started working around the studio, painting, drawing, trying to make something happen. And it was long and dark and hard. And then all of a sudden it came through. Uh, and now I'm here telling you about it. And somebody jumped up, uh, Barry Oshry. And Barry jumped up and ran up to the newsprint and said, say that again. And I laid it out. Mm -hmm. so that was a long time ago. That was like 1965. And um, I um, entered graduate school at the University of Minnesota and uh, Ed Psych and tried to figure it out there. They had no idea what I was talking about. Mm. Um, and then I um, accidentally met Frank Barron in California. And uh, Frank had studied the subject of creativity for a long time and knew Maslow. And by this time I had read Maslow and he said, I think you're on to something. You ought to be here, not Minnesota, which he well knew because he taught there with B.F. Skinner. <laughs> so he knew my chances were slim uh, of entering into anything unknown, <laughs> especially, <laughs> yeah, especially there. Um, I remember the, the dean of the graduate school saying, well, your argument is very cogent. It was the first time I'd heard that word. Uh, but no, we're not interested. Uh, but Frank was, and so that led to my moving out here and studying the process and pinning it down as much as I can. So now this is what I think happens, <laughs> that we make a statement. We say, I am going to talk about the creative process. You know, I am going to work in the studio. I am going to have a dinner party. I am going to lose some weight. We're doing this all the time. And you will hear your loved ones making such announcements as well. And we make this statement of intention. And it means clear the text, don't bother me. I'm going to be taking some time on Tuesday evening for two hours too, or I'm going to be attending a class with Skip on Wednesday morning. So clear the text. Don't plan on using my computer during that time. Get everything copied beforehand. We let people know. We clear mm -hmm. the decks. And we go into gathering. And gathering is when we start, we look in the refrigerator to see what we can put together for dinner. Or we talk about who are we going to invite for the party? What are we going to have to eat? We do the gathering. We look at the materials. We uh, we're making collages now. We begin to tear out the images out of magazines and begin to gather what it is that we want to be a part of this creative process. Now, while we're gathering, a lot of things happen in there. And um, this is where Jung came into the picture for me when he started talking about uh, the shadow and the dark side uh, and the collective unconscious. This is a walking in, well, I think of it as walking on stage actually, walking on stage and the collective unconscious is in the wings and it's saying, maybe now I can get her attention. Maybe now this is my chance to come on stage too. So, the collective unconscious is waiting for this opportunity. And we should be, if there's any shoulds in the process, attentive to it um, and realize that there might be some dark times when we don't know what's going on. Or we say, this is a waste of time or chuck the whole thing, start all over. Um, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't mean that you don't have it, but that'll happen too. I just don't have it. Um, maybe I'm not really an artist, um, which from a Jungian point of view would say, maybe my persona as an artist isn't really what I want. You know? Yeah, I guess, I guess that would be true. Um, but isn't, isn't everyone really at base an artist? 
and yes, put, exactly. putting together their life. Yeah. And kind of what you're talking about, this gathering where where you're gathering different elements of your life and and putting it together. You don't do it that much when you're children, but even when you're children, you're you're a child, you're gathering together, understanding what's happening around you and you know, learning your language that way too. It's really the way we all learn. And and so so the gathering, you know, then we gather together a spouse and and uh, then we end up having a child and so on. And, and uh, we gather together the education we need to live our, live our life and uh, yeah. either support our family or whatever. So anyway, um, I, I digress, but. Not at all. Not at all. Because it is the process of individuation. Absolutely. We, we, you know, we ask a child, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the child says, I want to be a fireman, or I want to be a firefighter, uh, or I want to be a mommy, or I want to be a teacher, uh, or I don't know what I want to be yet, you know. But yeah. that, that begins to happen. Those are the little statements of intention that are happening. And then we go off to college, and we're gathering. And at Minnesota, they say, wouldn't you like to be um, a high school counselor? You can probably use your art that way. Well, you know, if that's the only way I can be in graduate school here, I'll give it a try. And I did, you know, but that part of the gathering process, I had to chuck. Not that I didn't learn a lot because it was worthwhile sure. uh, to learn what I learned. And that's where I learned all my organization development skills. And so that those, those are still handy now. I don't think any of it's a waste of time. Yeah. You gather it in, but while you're gathering like this, you begin to make connections. Like, well, maybe I don't want to be in ed psych, you know, where, mm -hmm. where do I fit? Um, and what's going on in the individuation process is that we're looking at our persona. You know, what is the persona that I'm aiming for? What is it that I want my family to look like? What do I want to look like? Where do I want to, where do I want to get in my profession? Well, I better get that master's. I better get that PhD. You know, so uh, most of it, before we actively get on the process of individuation, most of it is in the name of developing the persona. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I think the individuation process is reflected here. Yeah, and that's the, and so developing the persona is really the work of art, of your life, of everyone's life. It certainly is, yeah. Right. Now, something happens then for those of us that are beginning to wonder, is that all there is, you know, <laughs> um, that uh, what else is there? Because all of this has been extroverted work for the right. most part. And so by the law of nature, we will begin to wonder about our introverted self or our collective unconscious. We'll say, all right, she looks pretty good out there on the stage. When are we going to get our chance to fill out the picture? The, these, like, these are parts of your psyche that are thinking that. Yes. Parts Autonomous are, parts. <laughs> and there, it's the anima. The animus for women, uh, it's the shadow. They're all there in the wings and they're having as much influence as possible. Mm -hmm. We've all experienced that. that for men, the anima will come around with uh, a new feminine. Uh, for a woman, an animus will come around for a new masculine. This often happens in graduate school, uh, college, or when you go back to school or uh, when you become deeply involved in your religion, it could be a projection onto a, um, a priest, you know, or a, a theologian, uh, as it will often happen for women. Um, so these are all parts of the collective unconscious, the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. Um, and, and it really rumbles around a lot by this time in our lives. And the um, question 
for most people is, well, how much do I want to upset this apple cart that I've worked so hard to put together? And um, it's okay, you know, according to Maslow, uh, 90% of the people will say, I like my apple cart just the way it is. It's just fine. And that's, that's good. That's what keeps the world going uh, around. But um, then there are some of us that say, this apple cart isn't working for me. And what is it that's missing? And actually, it's a whole huge big part of yourself that wants to come on stage actively and consciously instead of playing the game of mirrors um, that uh, to get as conscious as we can about these parts of ourselves. And that's what happens in the gathering process when we have these little intimations, things start to connect. Uh, we start to get some ideas. Oh, I think I could put this and this together doesn't make any sense, but it just feels right. So yeah, we get to intimation and we stick with intimation and put those pieces together and then voila, there will be an all of a sudden. Uh, but I think, I, I think that intimation is actually the most difficult concept to get. get. Everybody thinks they know what enlightenment is or, or revelation or what, whatever but but it's the intimation that i think we miss so i think that needs to be explored a little bit more well i agree with you and it's it's the um, most recent stage that i've understood you know through my daughter and her husband uh, new yorkers advertising teachers college columbia uh bringing in a very um well, I'll say extroverted, academic, uh, uh, corporal, look at these stages and saying, intimation, that's, those are the magic places in the process that you're right, we need to, under, we need to understand how precious they are. And, and to how to recognize them. Yes, you know, sometimes it's, how to, how to, actually this morning it happened to me when you and I started talking and I thought, where, where am I going to take notes? And I picked up this book that I haven't picked up for quite a while. And I thought, where, where am I going to find a blank page? Because every page has been used except for one. And the, so I opened it up and this image dropped out. This is an image that I've been waiting to use in my collage huh. a long time interesting uh, yes with a paintbrush now the image of the painter this has been coming up since i injured my wrist hmm. i can't push clay around like i used to uh -huh. and so i've been going to painting on clay I have yeah. my assistant roll out slabs and i paint on clay and doing other kinds of painting that's intimation. That's taking it seriously. Ordinarily, one might open it up and just get that out of the way. And yeah. this might. But what is this that's been sitting there for months and months and drops out? And there's another, another thing about this now that I've <laughs> been looking at images uh, more seriously. It's mm -hmm. in black and white. Yes. That means to me that it's something that hasn't happened yet. It's an idea that's waiting for color. It's waiting to come into color. And so I bring it into the present by finding an image that's in color that has this, this action going. So it's got a lot going for it if I take it seriously, if I include it, if I write about it, if I bring color to it. So that, that to me is an example of intimation. Taking seriously these little things that happen. And Jung's uh, term for it is synchronicity. Yeah. Um, 
I know at one point about 1995, I, I have had this feeling of wanting to paint or wanting to do something artistic. I first thought I wanted to sculpt and, uh, I started to sculpt with clay and um, it was terracotta, I guess. And, and my hands just totally dried up and I, I couldn't move. And, and uh, so I realized I just can't work in clay. And so that's when I went to painting and imagery wow. instead, of, instead of sculpting. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, that's an int intimation. That's saying yes, th yeah. th this one isn't for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I had some clay once that was doing that for me, and I had a dream in which a loud voice said, "Stop using that clay." Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's um, yeah, it's following following those voices seriously. Well, if I'm not going to do that, what am I going to do? Right. You know, because I'll, I'll find a way to create. Because as you said, the creative force is in all of us. The, sure. the drive to create is there. Just, just like the sexual drive is there. The spiritual drive is there. And somehow we've gotten it into our heads in our culture that the creative drive, some people have it and some people don't. It's just not true. Yeah. Be like saying some people have a spiritual drive and some don't. Or some that, have a sexual yeah. drive and some don't. It just isn't true. You don't get to decide. <laughs> right. Some be, some people have a spiritual drive, but it's toward materialism. And then they get to the point where uh, they've gotten everything that they could possibly get um, from a materialistic point of view and find that they're not happy. Yeah. Be because... because materialism that leads to a dead end ultimately hmm. at one level because we're still because we're still not whole yes you no know, it's not until we're whole that we we feel like we're trying to be whole or we're working on being whole or we believe that we're working on being sure. whole or we trust that uh that we're working on it mm -hmm. um so, so the intimations are, at, are the things that we take seriously after the persona has been addressed um, or while the creative process is unfolding. And yeah. so it's this voila. And, and we know now, um, I've done uh, experiments where we've hooked ourselves up and we know that we're going back and forth in our brain from alpha beta. We know now uh, that we understand the brain better, um, mm -hmm. that these are real experiences that our brain is having, that sure. our body is having. It's not a fantasy. I, I wish that uh, Carl Jung had, had that at his disposal. Wouldn't that have been an interesting thing for him to? Of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. He still had his culture that he had to deal with, and we still have our culture. Yeah. And so. Um, well, in these intimations, we have to also recognize that they have to come from us. They, they're not coming from a teacher, per se, because I have said a few times the story about when I was taking a pastel class and I was doing a portrait and. Um, suddenly the teacher comes up and speaks over my shoulder. Well, you can't do it that way. You have to do it this way. I said, no, I don't. <laughs> you know? yeah. And that was an intimation right there that, you know, yeah. this, this teacher isn't going to have anything for me uh, yeah. because my art is going to be different from what she was teaching. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. We had a ceramics teacher at UC uh, Santa Cruz. And um, and so I was wondering what was going on in the ceramic studios. You know, it had been a few years since I'd had my hands in clay. And so I went over there and to talk with the guy that was running the show and uh, explained to him. And, you know, I, I saw that everybody was making functional wear and mm -hmm. 
he was very dedicated to um, helping potters become potters that could make a living at it. And mm -hmm. that was a blessing. That's why we're one of, we're a very, very strong community in that regard mm -hmm. today. Um, so I told him what I was doing. And he said, I, I think I get it. Let me show you something. <laughs> and so he takes me out in the studio and there's a young woman working at the wheel and she's got about four bowls that she's thrown and they're fluted around the edges. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're sitting there and she's working on another one. And so he says to her, what do, you, what do you got going there? And she says, well, I had a dream last night that I had made these bowls with these fluted edges. And she said, I just had to come in here and do it. And um, he said, you know what? Something the Japanese learned a long time ago is that's never going to make it in the dishwater. Group. Chuck them. <laughs> it was over. It was over. Yeah. Whatever was going on in her unconscious, in her creative drive, true, they're not going to make it in the dishwasher, but that's not the point of the individual developing as a whole person. Right. So um, it just wasn't a place where I was going to be able to put my hands in clay once in a while. Right. Well, to have a teacher that says that instead of let, letting you discover that they don't make it in the dishwasher, that's yeah. the issue, isn't it? Yeah. That, that you know, if if she'd made those and and fired them and and used them for a little while and then boom, they they break, then she. Then she can go back and ask, okay, what made this break? But um, and she, what is the feminine that she was bringing to those bowls? You know, it could sure. be a mark instead. You know, there's could be the way she put the glaze on. Another yep. way of saying that to, to not give up, that's the personal voice. Also, mm -hmm. you know, that personal style that comes through, the personal right. voice that comes through. Sure. So, back to these stages and phases and now we're talking about how they are like phases because we go back and forth back and forth um so she fires those bowls and she finds out that um uh, it's not working she goes back what was your original statement of intention well i wanted to design something that had something feminine happening on it they don't all have to be the same you know? so she goes back and she makes another statement of intention it says now what let's gather the idea and see how many different ways can we do this you know and then which ones look like they're going to work intimation and then voila we go for it so that brings us through these first four stages now uh, this is something that scientists have known uh, there are people that have worked on this subject before and called it incubation. You probably know that word, illumination, which I've taken. Explosion was what I thought of it in the uh, at very first because it was is like an explosion that comes up. Uh, but um, these last two stages, I think, are so very, very important um, because Maslow said, we don't have to just sit around and wait for these to happen to us, these peak experiences, he called it. Uh, we can do things in our lives to arrange our lives so that we have more peak experiences. We have more creative processes going on in our life. And that's what inspired me to want to get a hold of the process. Maybe if we understood the process if I understood the process, I wouldn't have to be sitting around waiting for it. Um, that I would understand that when I'm feeling dry, nothing's going on, it's time for me to get myself to an art exhibit, to get up to San Francisco and take in, Alice Neal is at the Met right now in New York City. You, know, mm -hmm. if you don't know what to do, go there. You know, uh, Gather gather because when we're creating we're putting out we're putting out we're putting out and we have to do things to bring it back in we have to fuel our creativity it can't just it can't just go like a spigot that keeps going 
So that refueling. So um, I'm getting ahead of myself now because after illumination, I think that we need to stop and reflect on what has just happened to honor the experience that we've just had. Honor it like a spiritual experience. Uh, something new has come up. What does it mean for me? Um, what did I learn from this? How do I feel about what came up? Maybe I want to nudge it a little bit. You know, oh, it'd be better if I just did a, a little something here. You know, some kind of refinement might go on in reflection. But to take that time, which is time, capital T-I-M-E, which is so hard for us in our culture to do. And I am very product oriented and I am very inclined to create and go create and create and go create. I tend to be on to the next thing and it's the hardest thing for me um, to stop and write about it, uh, take a picture of it, put it up on the screen, look at it from a different angle, realize that something good is going on here, uh, that maybe this is a part of a series, it's not a piece all by itself, but to reflect on it. Mm -hmm. And then there is the very natural thing that the human being wants to do, and that's show it off go show it to somebody. Validation. I want to validate what has happened. Um, and that's so important because you're actually, you're telling your ego, hey, look, <laughs> I'm different. Something happened. You know, the ego doesn't really like this process very much because it usually means there's going to be some change. It's the ego that comes in and gives you a bad time during gathering and intimation. But when you come out and you say, I, I want you to see what I just did. And if you've ever had children, you know how they come up and say, look, look at what I did. Look at what I did in school today. And well, even, even having a child, a child, even the process of having a child, I'm sure, I'm sure in my own experience that, you know, when you, the first thing you want to do when you have a baby is get validation from your parents, from yeah. your grandparents, right? Absolutely. Want, that's right. Yeah. You want that's validation right. that this is a beautiful child that you created. Right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's such a good example. The, uh, this does describe the birthing process. Uh, let's, let's have a baby. Yeah. <laughs> let's absolutely. have a baby. And right. how exciting that is. And sometimes when, when somebody has finished a piece, I'll ask them to give it, well, always, they know, I ask them to give it a title. Mm -hmm. And there's often a, oh, I don't know, you know, they, um, a reluctance to do that much. But would you do that to a baby that you just had? You know, what's the name right. of your title? I don't know. <laughs> you know, right. call you know, it and of course, in the Bible, the, the they were going around naming things in Genesis, right? <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's quite quite an. It's we've been doing this. This is in our DNA. Sure. Do this, and when we don't do it, we get into trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, it it's going to manifest one way or the other. And to me, the insurrection was a manifestation of creativity in our culture gone dark. It's, it's going to happen one way or the other. And when we get so clogged up, and this culture is clogged up, we've been walking around with half a culture. Just we've been walking around with our heads and We've done a fabulous job, but the rest of us has got to, our hearts have got to catch up with our heads and our guts have got to catch up with our hearts and our head. Uh, because when we get clogged up, it goes dark. When we're not conscious of it, it'll go dark. Right. The other night you were saying, uh, 
something about the uh, shooting last week in Minnesota and the unconscious, the significance of the unconscious there. And I wonder if you'd speak to that for a minute. Yes, sir. I was so uh, struck about um, Kim Potter, the police officer who shot and killed Dante Wright. Um, I thought, what has happened? This is a woman that did this. I didn't think a woman police officer would do this. So I uh, realized that a stereotype of mine got broken, uh, that the feminine is as polluted by this overabundance of macho power as the masculine is. Um, and I have this, uh, I still feel this um, kind of empathy for Kim Patterson. Potter, Kim, Kim yeah, Potter. Kim Potter, yeah, sure. Um, and I thought, what is this is strange? I, I have no compassion for what's his name, who did George Floyd. Can't even yeah. tell you his name right now, and it's in front of me, you know, every day on TV and on the newspapers. Um, have no compassion for him, but I have compassion for her, and um, how horrible. Maybe it's because she's a woman, and if one were to lose a child, you know, to if this were to happen, uh, so that's one part of it. Another part of it is. It's a white female. I'm sorry, or, it's a what? A white, white female oh. that killed. And mm -hmm. so what does this mean to our collective unconscious? What, what is it that's come up? And one of my students suggested that um, maybe it's the pain that women are feeling about not being able to express how battered women are that we know that every day there's a woman being murdered. Mm. And yet we don't dare talk about that as women because how could you talk about this? Look at what everybody, you know, you have no right, particularly uh, white women because we've benefited from this patriarchy uh, as well as suffered from this patriarchy. So it's, it's very mixed, very, complex uh, and I do think that it's not the end of that story I, I'm I want to hear from Kim Potter you know what her feelings are what I what's going on in her although I've not been at all interested in what's been going on with the males that have murdered so I can feel this you know <laughs> there's a big peace in the wings that's unfolding now. Yeah, well, the Floyd murder was quite conscious. That behavior was quite conscious, whereas Kim's was unconscious. And uh, the same as, you know, the whole thought that we would have Americans representing nearly half of our country who would attack our capital uh, it, you know, that was unconscious. Who would have thought of that? You couldn't have written it. You know, you couldn't have written it as a novel before it actually happened. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the woman that got shot there. Yes, sure. And then men as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the first, which was also stunning. Yes. Event. So... And then, then they're calling it an accident. Uh, but Jung, would Jung call that an accident? No, that's right. He would not. Yeah. No, yeah. he would not. And uh, people who own tasers say you can tell the difference between a taser and a gun when you have them in your hands, particularly if you're a 26-year veteran uh, in the police force. And uh, you're training people how to work with tasers. And you have to draw it with the opposite hand. 
because they're wearing it on the opposite side of their body and yeah. so on. So something caused her to go to her dominant hand instead of her non-dominant hand yeah. to, to draw that, to draw the pistol when she intended to draw the, the taser yeah. um, and, and didn't even realize it until after she'd fired. Yeah. Right. And then realizes it and says, I shot him. Yeah. Yeah. So she realizes it right away. <sighs> it just shows oh. how, how something that simple can just turn a life around because here's a woman who's a 26 year veteran has been the president of the, of the local union and <laughs> police union. And all of a sudden she finds herself, uh, accused of a second degree of manslaughter and in jail with yeah. people that she might have jailed in fact so yeah. what yeah. what a what a situation to have happened to your life but you know we all have things that are shocking that happen to our life that and we need ways to build ourselves out of it so yeah. so maybe Maybe you could envision for me for a moment in your imagination what Kim Potter should do to, to change her life. For I, I mean, aside from the fact that she's, she's going to be uh, going to jail probably because she'll probably plead guilty to something. And, um, and if she doesn't, then there, it's even in a trial by jury she's going to be convicted i think and um and so here she, here she is in jail after all that happens uh, what does she do now yeah well i would from a jungian point of view i would guess that she's, that her, her uh, that she's overdeveloped in her conscious thinking self and underdeveloped in her unconscious. Yeah. So that her unconscious is running wild. She's not, um, she's not in touch with the power of her unconscious mm -hmm. and in our culture we're so overloaded with the destructive masculine principles in our culture i think the few minutes not minutes few seconds before uh when i uh, that before she shot him uh, seeing the video i see how the man behind her is treating um, Dante. Mm -hmm. And I said, why is he yelling at him like that? You know, escalating, escalating, escalating. Mm -hmm. And um, she got caught in that yeah. escalation. And the unconscious just came out, just like the insurrection. All the people that got caught in that insurrection that didn't intend for what happened to happen. Yeah. But they got caught in it because really the unconscious is running this show. Yeah, for sure. In our country. It's yeah. running the show, and we better get to know it and engage it and try to get as conscious as we can. Right. Uh, but I, I was, I agree with you entirely. But the question I was really asking was how does, um, uh, Kim Potter um, recreate herself yeah. during this time that she has lots of reflection time, obviously looking yeah. forward to. And, um, you know, what, from your perspective, how does she recreate her life going I forward? Say, start writing. Start, start writing. writing. Start yeah. writing and writing and writing. Uh, who am I? Who am I and who are we as human beings? You know, we're, we're just 
animals. We happen to be human animals, but yeah. that's um, who are we? What can I do? She's um, got a lot of skills. She has True. a lot of training skills. Yeah. Um, so I think first to see how, how I would say, how have I gotten so out of balance that I did this? What is it that I need to do about myself that that could have happened? And then, then what do I do for humankind? You know, um, I think as I said at the time, um, we women have a place at the table now, mm -hmm. um, politically, corporate, but um, our principles now need to be instilled. That, that's the next level is just a, a, a seat at the table isn't quite enough. You know, yeah. it's got to happen first. But then uh, those principles, how are the feminine principles being instilled in the training of the police force? We, we, can you define those? Well, um, I remember hear, hearing somebody define them uh, that I thought sounded beautiful, that the police force ought to be somebody that you can call when you're in trouble mm -hmm. and not be afraid of how they're going to be when they arrive at the door. Uh, the police force is not armed with loaded ammunition. Mm -hmm. um, they're people that are experts at de-escalating, experts, sure. experts at it. Right, and sure. uh, there should be a lot of them a lot of them on the streets. They should be everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we know that their job is to de-escalate or to help mm -hmm. if somebody has fallen down or somebody's purse has just been stolen. Yes. Or if somebody has pulled a gun. Um, I can understand how frightened they must be. Too. Really? You know, uh, it's a two-way, somebody described it last night on television, it's a two-way street. You know, they're as afraid as um, the people that are victims of yeah. them are. I, I want to say something about how creativity, uh, how our developing our creativity is a part of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's such a stretch for us as Americans now that it's hard to make the connection, but that there is a connection. When I went to Omoto in Japan to their school uh, for a few weeks, they teach you tea ceremony, Aikido, uh, ceramics, flower arranging, calligraphy. Every day for several hours every day. You have something different to wear for each class, as you can imagine. Um, and you become indoctrinated. And we, in tea ceremony, which should really be a glad event. It's not as serious as we tend to think it is. Um, after the lesson, uh, we were talking with the teachers and saying, why are you treating us this way? We're, we've been your enemy. Mm -hmm. Why are you treating this way, us this way? And the tea master said, well, perhaps if the American male came home to tea ceremony every afternoon, we wouldn't have to worry about nuclear warfare. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a big connection to try to make. Sure. But that's what these people are devoted to. Mm -hmm. They believe that if you do Aikido, if you do tea ceremony, if you make a simple pot, you can't kill somebody. And when they're looking for the terrorists, they don't go into the art ghettos. No. <laughs> it's not where you're going to find your serial murderer. Right, right. Yeah. Interesting. So I do believe that there is a connection, and I, I it's sourful mm -hmm. that it's such a big stretch. But that's what I'm about. Right now, mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk about uh, these tenets of for creativity, uh, which you also sent across? I, I'll just put yes. them up on the screen. Uh, yes, this is. Um, I think these are important. I, I um, took heart uh, uh, in reading Jung's concepts of art. 
and what is real art, good art, and real art. What <laughs> what in the world that means, you know? But um, he talks about the kind of art that we do where we're copying something outside of ourselves, which has great value for honing your skills. But to understand that that's what it's for is honing your skills. But then there is the art that we go within to do. And that art that we go within to do is um, it's building the voice of the self. It's turning the ego around from trying to get it right to listening to the self. And that's why I do the doodle exercise because each of us has a different mark and that mark shows up in our artwork. Now, why is that? You know, why is it that something like a doodle the energy of that doodle shows up in one's artwork, but it's so pervasive yeah. that if I were to show you a Georgia O'Keeffe that you'd never seen before and a Picasso that you had never seen before, you would know which is which. And why is that? It's because their mark is so pervasive. They might draw the same character, but you're going to know who is who. So developing that individual mark and knowing it, because, you know, I'd go to the shelf and look at the students work. And I know who's, I know who's everybody's work is. Yeah. Why is that? And everybody else knows it too. I'm not the only one. Everybody knows yeah. who's, who's. Why is that? Become conscious of it and develop it so that your mark isn't just the same circle over and over, but maybe that circle begins to take on another mark. Um, my Gestalt therapist did a study of the marks that different civilizations do as they are developing and then crashing. And at first they make simple circles, which a lot of us do at first, and then they begin to build in angles and then they begin to build in a dynamic and they get really good. And that's when their work becomes very popular as it did with the Jomon artists in Japan mm -hmm. 10,000 years ago. And they became so popular that they began to mass produce. The work went down, more circles, less angles, kaput. They were done. Mm -hmm. So uh, it happens with great artists too. They get a gimmick and then it slides off, off of the market um, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, we see, this we, we see this manifesting uh, in our politics, too, because, um, you know, the NRA had a great gimmick for a while. I think it's, it's time has passed. <laughs> uh, which, was, which was, say a little more about that, but well, the, the gimmick was to uh, get you to believe that you could protect yourself if you owned a weapon at home. Mm -hmm. And contrary to the statistics, because the statistics say that if you own a weapon, your likelihood of dying from a gunshot wound are something like 17 times more likely if, if you own a pistol in your house, wow. uh, for example. And... You know, I, I have a, a friend who um, for more than almost 60 years now, because he was a high school classmate, but he owns more than 50 guns. And I said, what, what are you going to do with all those guns? And he said, well, I want to protect myself in case my government comes and tries to confiscate my guns. <laughs> I said, well... You, you do know that your government has tanks and F-18s, right? If they want to confiscate your guns, they're going to do it, <laughs> right? Wow. And you can only use one at a time anyway. So, you know, <laughs> good, good grief. I mean, that, that's, that, that's in the category of a fetish. And where, where did the term backfire come from? Do you know? 
Uh, well, yeah, it came from um, from automobiles, okay, and and it came from automobiles where the the piston was firing, and then while the piston is recovering and preparing to fire again, there's a, there's a little bit of fuel left in the system, and it typically it fires in the back. Ah. Or especially in old cars, but we're yeah. like a hundred years ago cars, not Model T cars. So yeah. this this fuel would get into the system and it would get to the back of the car and it would hit the heat of the exhaust system and boom, right? Uh -huh. That I think that is the origin of the backfire we use. I, I don't think it has to do with guns, but it uh, but it could be a metaphor for what happens when we're not using up our creative energy. Surely. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, because, uh -huh. because the creation, obviously, is the explosion that's causing the piston to go yeah. down to run your wheels. And, and, uh, and that's obviously creative of that power. But, yeah. but if it's not all used, then it can somehow be a terrible thing, right? Yeah, and that's what we're living with now. Yeah, right. what we're living with now, and it's a terrible thing. Yeah. No. And, and well, the, 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 uh, then the personal voice vocabulary. Um, I remember one of my teachers, Mary Holmes, saying, if you don't know what you want to talk about in the studio when you come in, well, then don't bother coming in because it's just a waste of time. And that, um, to, to a certain extent, I think is true. Um, Lilith is a character that I like to work with. And I'll, if I have, I'll walk into the studio, if I don't have an idea when I'm walking in, I'll say, I wonder what Lilith would say about Potter, Kim Potter. Mm -hmm. And I can begin to write about that. I've mm -hmm. just made, um, I've just made an intimation that I think maybe I can work with. Mm -hmm. So that's getting in touch with what you want to talk about. Sure. We did it also in the um, Mark of the Self class when we took our large doodles mm -hmm. and we folded them into quarters and we titled each quarter. Um, yeah. We gave each quarter something like what I would do if or another one was what I really want to say is, mm -hmm. um, or another one was after that, I will, <laughs> you know, so the, they were very wonderful prompts. Right. We found that there were four different <laughs> voices sure. that we had yeah. that had something to say. So um, these prompts are really helpful. We, ha we have to feed our creative drive. We right. can't just expect it. You, know, you have, you have, we to, have to We have to let it flow somehow. So we have to have a prompt to get it flowing. And yeah. uh, it's, it's like uh, my favorite Hemingway quote, which is uh, he's asked, you know, how do you go about writing a novel? And he said, well, I open a vein and bleed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, but the point was that that you have to, when these creative juices get going, you just have to let it flow. And, yeah. and then something illuminating happens. And um, I'll just tell you a short anecdote in my own life. One time, my, we had these beautiful photographs of my parents when they were young. My mother was 18 and in this beautiful uh, blue sweater cashmere sweater and my father was in his midshipman uniform oh, from oh. the naval academy when when they were just before they were married of course and uh, they were always on the wall of our farm ha house and so I said boy I'd really like to copy those in some way to paint the, those images oh, oh. and see what happened. And I, I was in a, at a very pedantic stage of my interest in art. And so I tried to do it by making hash marks across my paper and then trying to 
put the exact shape that was in each little square on, in the hash marks, right? But what happened to me, I was sitting in our farmhouse and I was, my parents were upstairs and um, I started to, I started to do that and to draw them in with colored pencils. And all of a sudden I did have this sort of illumination where uh, it just started to flow and, and it was just the most fantastic feeling. And, and so I, I wasn't worried about the hash marks anymore at all, nothing like that. And uh, this went on to like three or four in the morning and I did both paintings uh, that way. And when my mother came down in the morning, she looked at these two paintings as if they were the revelation from God. I mean, no kidding. I mean, she was, she was just amazed by the two images that I had created. And she, that day went down frame, got a, got frames for them and replaced the photographs that had been on the wall for 40 years with those, with oh. my, with oh. my two paintings. And, and, uh, you know, I'm, I don't claim that those two portraits are great art, but I, but the whole experience, the experience of having an inner voice take over and, and cause me to paint it that way. And then to have my mother's reaction to it was very, very powerful. And it's so. such a, um, that's it. You just described the process. So you wanted to um, validate, do something about the photographs. So yeah. you decided you were going to do that. You entered into gathering yeah. and you made some lines and put some things together. Uh, it wasn't exactly working out. You tried something else. Uh, you yeah. had to let some things go. All of a sudden you go into an altered state of consciousness and it's coming forth and it's luminous, as you said, all of yeah. a sudden it's luminous. And this spiritual awareness, your mother, oh, I, yeah. You know, it, it, I mean, to this day, as you can tell, I mean, I'm, I'm emotional about it even now because it was a spiritual experience, yeah. you know, and- And the validation. Way. Yeah, the, when my mother came down and, and validated it, it, it was incredible. But the, you know, I, I'd say there was an hour and a half when I was drawing the lines and doing it very pedantically. And then all of a sudden, this other part of me engaged. And for like four hours, I, I was just doing these two paintings by myself in the in the dark. There was one light on and and I was working in our in our dining room, and and my mother comes down in the morning, and oh, oh she just was so moved. And and this happened when I was like in my mid fifties, maybe. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it was it wasn't like it was a child being being yeah. a, an attaboy from mom, but but um, rather rather you know it was just her reaction, which was itself so moved. I mean, she, she was speechless by it. And, and uh, you know, as, well, I, as I say, that wasn't great art, but, it was, but in terms of what it meant between me and her was yeah. huge, right? The, the entry of the feminine into the process is so beautiful. It, mm -hmm. it is like the anima coming into the process and yeah. what the feminine coming into the process does, bringing this spiritual awareness, um, so yes. beautiful. Yeah, speaking of, of the feminine and my mother, I'll just show you a quick picture because I keep it on my desktop. But this is this oh, is really this oh. is the image when she was eighteen years old. I think this was her senior in high school image, oh. and and. I know that this is my anima because um, both of my wives have had long brown 
hair like this and dark eyes like this and and every time i meet a woman that meets that matches that template boy boom my uh, yeah. I, I lose my head. Fortunately, I've studied young enough to know that that's my anima talking and not, yeah. <laughs> not my conscious mind. Yeah. I'm going, I want to um, go on to the third thing. Oh, yeah. Let's, let's do that. <laughs> Let, let's do um, is managing your creative process. And I think that's important. You know, so to know your style, to know what it is that you have to say, but to know that you are in a process and the process is going on all the time. And where are you in the process? You know, um, are you in gathering? Uh, should you be spending more time reflecting on your work? Is it time for you to show somebody what it is that you've been doing? Where are you in the process? Are you not committing to your statement of intention? Um, or here in the in the studio, you know, when I see somebody in tears, what's going on with your process? Well, I just don't have it today. Oh, come on now. You're in process. What's going on? To recognize that we're in a process and to manage it, to respect it, to honor it. Uh, it's part of the reflective part. So it's those three things, style, what is it you have got to say? And you are in a process. Mm -hmm. You can't get out of it. Right. When I thought I was dried up, you 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 can't get out of it. You're in it. Well, of course, that's that's the story of life, which is uh, uh, yeah. that life itself is a process. And when we're we're growing up, we're getting the tools to be problem solving creatures, um, and um, you know, adult humans are solving problems seven, all day long, in yeah. all, all waking hours and yeah. of all kinds. And, and uh, to understand how to face that responsibility with, with maturity is a key element. And yeah. as uh, I just want to put this up back up on the screen, because, um, you know, the point the point is that, um, especially in this personal vocabulary, when you're going to, to school to learn something, you get a vocabulary. And, you know, I realized early on that law school was really about learning vocabulary, right? <laughs> learning how to use the library. It wasn't about the nuts and bolts of making a lot of money practicing law. It was really about vocabulary. And so, and the same obviously is true in art school where you're learning, you know, what different tools or devices that you would use in art are, are yeah. part of your personal vocabulary. And, yeah. and so you have to learn to manage the process. And what has impressed me so much about our relationship is that you've pointed out to me that you know, notwithstanding uh, whatever vocabulary you may put together in school, um, we all have to be creative. We all have to understand that even our building our lives at all is a creative process. And, yeah. Yeah. and uh, I think that's, if we could do no other thing, it would be to help people understand that. Yeah. Um, you know, because we, we've been through this rationalistic second half of the 20th century where we, you know, wrote art classes and music classes out of the, ah. out of the school system. And, yeah. and, you know, honestly, those, the, at least the art classes that I attended when I was in junior high school and elementary school were actually worthless. So uh, we, we actually have to teach our teachers better. Yes. Uh, yeah. With, yes. with these points uh, because we have to say what it's about. It's not about, you know, can you draw the eyes in the right position on a face? Mm -hmm. It's really more about how do you see the eyes, you know, from, yeah from within and yes. um 
um, that that um, a, a case in point is when we we brought a, a Dutch sculptor Nick Jank, who is very well known in Europe in Holland um, to teach here, and uh, we had a master class, and uh, we had a sculpt a, a model, mm -hmm. and. Um, when we couldn't afford to have the model in the afternoons, only in the mornings. And um, one of the artists said, well, I have a good model and maybe if we all chipped in, you know, we could have her in the afternoons. Great, bring, bring her on. And so he did. And after 20 minutes or so, Nick said to Daniel, the guy that brought her, um, Do you, don't you think the model should take a break? And uh, Daniel said, oh, no, she's, she's a real pro. She, she can handle this. So another 20 minutes goes by and Nick says, I, I think it's time for the model to take a break. Mm -hmm. And Daniel says, no, no, she's really tough. She's very strong. She, she's okay. And Nick says, but her fatigue is going to show up in your drawings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's not getting that arm just right, you know. <laughs> That's not what it's about. Yeah, yeah. you got to look it, and feel and be empathic. I got to the point where I could do a portrait like this. And oh. only oh. only with a palette knife. No, I never touched this painting with a brush. And, That's a beautiful painting. And and this this is a self-portrait. Actually, it's based on a photograph that was taken in 1970. And um, it was during an operation in Vietnam. And it contains everything that I have to say about the Vietnam War and everything that I have to say about the Vietnam War is contained in the white of the left eye. Um, and... <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, I do believe it. And and so that's why and that's what I found happens to me when I'm doing a portrait is that I I enter I do enter that space and it's been happening all along, but a lot of cases people don't like that the result because it's too honest. And or it's so honest. <laughs>